Hello. My poor audio friend. I just scratched my nail all over his thing. Welcome back. Everyone get a chance to get a break, check their phones, make all those agency calls that you just can't not do when you're stuck at a conference. Is that not the worst part of being at a conference is that clients don't go to bed for the whole duration of it? It's the worst part for me. So, you know, things don't end. I'm on a book deadline, by the way, which is today. So right now I'm writing the last chapter of Google Plus for Business. I bet you can't tell, but that's what I told my editor. We lie to editors the way we lie to spouses, I think. No, really, honey, I did get that done. And then you rush and get it done. Did Sarah sneak in and I just didn't see her, by the way? Sarah. Oh, Sarah, there you are. Thank you. I, I did not just see you. Hi. I was having a little panic moment because, you know, I'm going to make you go second. Uh, <clears throat> Who was not here in the first hour? Oh, my gosh. Naked people, cream cheese, and kissing. I can't believe you missed it. Right, everybody else? Oh, my gosh. I have no idea what panel you thought was better than that. But naked people, cream cheese, and kissing. I'm not even making that up. Craft foods, uh, house party, and desigual, and uh, oh my gosh, a friend to friend. In this hour, it's a little less naked. This is my friend Dave Lineberry. Hi, Dave. Hey. Uh, Dave is director of interactive experience at Campbell Ewald, and also known as Dave Zilla on Twitter, and also has the blog DaveZilla.com. Should you want to find things that you didn't know you needed to find, you should spend time on DaveZilla.com. Uh, our conversations have been, in, in the first hour as well, about how do we really make this social media thing work. Uh, this is a um, buzzword. We are here to ridicule buzzwords. We are here to laugh at these ideas that one must join the conversation. Uh, engage, find the influencers, etc. We're really trying to look for the, the meat underneath all that unicorn. So with, without any more uh, shenanigans, I would like to present Dave Linebury. And for those of you who weren't here earlier, my name is Chris Brogan, and I'm just your feckless host. Dave. You guys hear me? Yeah, OK. Um, I'm sorry I didn't use the official template. I'm not into PowerPointless. So. Um, but hi, I'm Dave. Um, like Chris said, I'm from um, Davezilla, and I've, the only way you might have known me is I got sued for the word Davezilla by the people who own Godzilla, and I beat them with my blog, so now I'm a verb in the Urban Dictionary, and I also helped invent WordPress. Other than that, I'm kind of a jerk. Um, and this is what I mean, because I'm going to be kind of ripping on our own industry, but I'm in the industry, so I, it's okay. Um, a lot of the agencies that are talking about social media, I really don't think most of us get it yet. And it's really sad because it's everybody else does. <laughs> um, but if you looked at some of the um, stats, they said that over the last, since 2009, 67% has gone away from traditional and social media, which is still in its infancy, hence the fetal baby, um, is growing up, but depending on whose numbers you believe, up to 55% this year, I'm guessing. Um, but here's what bothers me. If you gave a million and a half, if a client says, I got a million and a half dollars, which is a gigantic budget, but it's, you know, a lot of clients have that, and said, how should I spend that? Most account people are going to say, well, let's put, um, we're going to do one TV spot, but we really don't have a whole lot of key targets that we can do with a million and a half. That's really not much to work with. But we'll put away $50,000 for social. And you'll be lucky with that. Um, whereas I would go, got a million and a half, I could do a lot with that. Um, if you gave me that same amount of money, instead of your TV spot, I could do $24,000, $50,000 social media content pieces and six giant video things for YouTube in a year, or maybe a lot more than that. And that's a ton. I mean, if you thought about how many tools you could buy with that to do your stuff, you could get, with 50000 a month, you could have Bright Edge, you could have Radian 6 and HubSpot and a million other things, which is pretty awesome. And Sprinkler. Um, so here's the other thing that's bugging me. What's old and busted? Hours-based pricing. We got to get away from that. We got to move towards performance-based pricing like the SEO companies are doing. It's more money, one, and it makes more sense. If you said we're going to get you X and you actually get way, way more than that and do way, way more than that, you make more money. Um, look at how the SEO companies are doing it. It makes more sense. Second, AOR stuff's kind of on the way out. You probably noticed that. It's not as common as it used to be. And your developers are getting screwed on hours funding because they don't work that way. They work on projects and campaigns. 
Campaign thinking is this. Governance is this. It's like when Obama was running, everyone's like, oh, I want to be part of that. Yeah. Everyone wants to be part of campaigns. But as soon as it's like, okay, now I've got to run the damn country, everyone's like, who will help me bake the bread to the little brown hen? You know, no one, not I. Everyone's running away. But that's the really important part, and it's also where the relationship is. Um, and then stop thinking of your, as marketers, and start thinking of everyone as like publishers, which you should know by now. And the other one, this one really kills me, is the annual planning all agency meeting should go away in favor of um, shorter strategies that are based on what your um, analytics are telling you every day because you might have micro strategies that make way more sense. Everyone, no, no rocks at me yet? Okay. But all this adds up to being something Chris said earlier, which is this is a lot of labor. It takes more bodies to do this if you actually want to reach a lot of people, and I agree with that wholeheartedly. So that's why I have a lot of people working on my social media group. And this is also, according to your clients, age of accountability. Sorry, that's the only cheesy effect I'll do. Um, but a lot of the advertisers from other agencies, I'm not calling ours because we don't do this, still claim that like ROI can't be measured or they, they give excuses why it can't. Yes, it can. You have to be diligent and ask for lifetime value and all those things that are hard to get. And you're, The reality is most of your clients don't even know what ROI is either. They just think it's a cool thing, but you need to give them something to read or better yet, something to use while they're occupied. Um, and what they really want is insights, which was brought up earlier too. People want, I know, everyone likes pictures of people in the toilet. I'll take a picture. Um, so I had to go along with it. I didn't mean naked people, Chris, sorry. <laughs> um, but they really want insights and they want to know what's really, really happening um, with what's going on. Um, and maybe you didn't notice, but economy's kind of taking a tank and so your staffing is all going away to Google and getting good stuff and your bonuses are not as good as they used to be. And it might be time to rethink secondary benefits. If you guys read the good Giga Ohm article a couple, last week, it was a really good example of that. That um, most of the younger people today, you can give them money to a point where they're like, you know what, I really just want to be able to choose between Mac PC or Linux or an I working on an iPad. I don't really care about the bonus size. I don't really care of an extra salary. If I, can't, if I have to work in a PC or I have to work, you know, I'm not, it's off. And there's people who really won't take jobs because of that, which is bizarre, but it's a yield killer for some people. Um, so some of those secondary benefits are actually kind of important. And here's a case study, because Chris wanted one, but it's not really a case study. It's kind of just stuff we're doing that, for one client that I hope you like. So Navy, very old, very, very stodgy, used to be. 16 to 24 year old demographic. They should be unsure, but they are definitely unsure about social media. A few years ago, not so much anymore. You want to find who's the strongest advocates of social media, it's the US military. For by far, they've changed, it's changed the way they do everything. Um, we started with the Navy, the first thing we did with them was a YouTube channel, branded channel, a long time ago. And we did page takeovers. I'm not a fan of those, but I will admit they work really, really well on YouTube. And we get an enormous number of views when we do them. Um, and I'm just not a fan of them because they get in the way of me watching videos about cats falling over. But um, we have people, I mean, this is all about content. On here, it's really proven because I was astonished to see that we were averaging like 88,000 views for videos of chaplains talking about their job. People wanted to see it, and they would sit through a 12-minute video for that. Um, same, Twitter, we found out one of the things that works really, really, really well for us with sponsored tweets, um, we were getting an average of a 5% click-through on those, which if you're used to doing banners, is pretty damn good. Um, Ning, we did a, com a community a few years ago. You may have heard of it. It's called Navy for Moms. The way we got it started was we had TV Spot in Boston area, and we did some local blogging and local events telling people. And um, actually, if you were in um, the city of Boston at the time, the whole, what they actually did was painted a lot of the city blue, and they lit up aircraft carriers blue in the uh, harbor and everything. So they did this whole thing, they called it Paint the Town Blue, but it was all a, a pro-Navy experience thing. What we were trying to do was answer a question, which is, um, why aren't kids joining the military? And it turned out the biggest thing in the world that would stop them is their mom. And so we made a site that would let moms talk to moms who already had kids in the military. Navy was not allowed in there. They were not happy about that, but it turned out to be a really smart thing. We got 54,000 women on there every single day. 
Um, but that, at, this is the interesting thing, is once that thing got going to around 1,000 moms, I want to say, we stopped advertising, and we got the same number of signups every day because they were inviting each other. We also do a lot of Facebook for military, for Navy. Um, and this isn't even all the pages we have. This is just how many I felt like getting screen grabs of before I ran out of steam. Um, we, we don't do tons of push to these, but we've, just to get them jump started, we will. We'll do those hybrid ads where someone's face is in there. Those seem to work pretty good. Polls actually work better. And then we do a lot of social CRM. And what the social CRM is in this case, each one of these pages for Navy, you're probably going like, why isn't there just one Navy page? Well, Navy has a problem, and that's that they have officers which have required degreed programs. Like if you, they need, you know, gynecologists and lawyers and all these other things that are really hard to get. And if, and if you're competing for that kind of a degreed professional, military is not one of your first choices. So we had to get, find a way to get people to want to do that. And what we did was um, I told the admiral, why don't you get 20 to 30 people who are in that profession to answer everyone's questions on the wall because the recruiters really don't know much. They got like one paragraph about every job. So they're kind of useless. Their good thing is though, if someone goes on there and, yeah, I am a cryptologist. You want to know exactly what that MD hash is? I will explain that to you. And they're getting really, really specific questions on there and getting answers. And guess what? We start getting direct leads from Facebook. Now, you can't sign up for the military from Facebook. Relax. Your kids aren't going to do that. It's against the law. What we did have to do was make a hot lead transfer process to get them to a recruiter within 24 hours. Turns out it worked out pretty good. Navy has now moved 91% of their budget over to social media, which is saying a lot. And the other 9% is mostly resume mining and um, a few local college event things. But this is how well it's worked for them. They don't really see, they don't do any TV anymore. There's no more of those Godsmack commercials. Um, it's more Facebook now. So I think our advertising model in general, it's hurting because we're not, people aren't getting it and they're kind of treating it like it's still a push model with a bigger audience or a different audience and it's not. But I don't think it's broken. I do think though that we can make money in social media. We do it. You guys can too. And I was, I said I was going to brief and I am. So bye. Oh, that Dave Linnebury. You can actually uh, watch that on half speed later, and it'll be. <laughs> Director of Caffeine Consumption as well at Campbell Ewald. Um, Sarah, why don't you come on up? And I don't know if you've got a, if one of these gigs is yours, but uh, we should do that. I don't know if we tore yours apart or not. Sarah uh, Personette is Director of Global Agency Relations at Facebook, which is, uh, you know how, uh, for me anyway, I get this question a lot because I happen to use social media. They always think I know somebody at the places. Like, do you hang out with somebody at Facebook or do you know somebody at Twitter I can call to get the this? Um, mob her afterwards. Uh, that's a business card you need for that, you know, crazy, like my wall got shut down or something question that everyone always has. Or, you know, there's somebody who says they're Coke and it's just like a 14-year-old boy. These are the things that I'm often asked about Twitter. So it's a ditto over at Facebook. So for that, for setup, uh, the, the interesting part of starting with Dave's agency, of course, is that some of you in the room who are uh, feel the pain. And now here's the other side with the, the platform side as well. So... All that, Sarah, and Sarah Personette, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Um, I am the head of our global agency team, which uh, started about seven or eight months ago. Um, I actually, the majority, actually, how many people are from an agency in the room today? Yeah? How many from publishers? Clients? Okay. So for the agencies in the room, I actually completely feel your pain. I've spent my entire career prior to Facebook on the agency side, um, which is why when Cheryl and David Fisher and uh, Blake Chanley said, we want to start a group that is dedicated to agencies and moving them forward, it was one of the best things I had ever heard because it's the perfect hybrid of what I love, which is the agency world and the work that you guys do as agencies of your clients, and Facebook. Um, and so the 
things that I really wanted to talk to you about today are the five things that you can do. Things to be thinking differently as you prepare for campaigns, as you prepare for your planning processes, whether they are 24-7 or whether they are annual planning. Things to be doing differently today that can be inspired through the platform. So the first thing I wanted to say was uncover the social insight. There are two key questions that we use to define a social insight. Why do I care and why do I share? If you don't have that written into a creative brief or a media brief at the start of your planning process, you've missed the opportunity to uncover and design really shareable and inspiring um, ideas that can exist on the platform. And a case study that I wanted to talk you through really quickly is Flair Magazine. It's a magazine, it's a fashion magazine actually that's outside of the US, so you might not be familiar with it. But the social insight that they discovered was that women actually like to share what they see and how they're inspired in terms of fashion, not from what they're reading always in magazines or what they're seeing on television or on, and on celebrities, but what they see on everyday women. So they created an application where you could tag your friends, not just tagging your friends in terms of their names, but you can tag them with a flare tag. That flare tag in the, their accessories, their clothing, the earrings they're wearing, the way that their hair is dressed, all those different types of things actually then populate the flare Facebook page and then the top designs and the top accessories are actually published in the monthly magazine. What they wound up seeing is that people wanted to share what was happening. They wanted to share what they were seeing, how they were being inspired by the everyday fashion of the women around them. And it was a very in innovative way to also use our tagging capabilities and to leverage photos, which are one of our most engaging native applications on the platform today. The second thing that I wanted to walk you through was audit your site for social integration. So any agency in the room, and certainly probably any client in the room that works on your website, is doing a lot of, of auditing of your current website in terms of optimizing against organic search. You need to do that same thing for social as well. How can you prepare, not just for today, but for tomorrow, in understanding the social plumbing that's going to go underneath this site? And the way you can think about that is what are the things that are actually, and what is the content on my site that can be more shareable, that can be more engaging when it's personalized with my friend connections, and how do I bring that relevancy into play on the site today? So I wanted to showcase a quick example. This is a snapshot from, or a screen grab from a Levi's um, website from like five plus years ago. And looks like a standard website, right? This is the look and feel today. So I can't fully see my screenshot to walk you through, but what you're seeing is that I've actually logged on as myself I can go to the friends store. I can see which of my friends like Levi's. I can like a variety of different pairs of jeans that every time I like one of those, that hits my news feed, which gets branding delivered for Levi's and becomes relevant content for my friends who are especially excited that I like Levi's. And then I'm also able to see down below what's been cut off is that my friend Megan Carnes and a series of other people have commented on specific uh, experiences with Levi's, jeans that they like, fashion styles that they like. And then on the far right side, what Levi's has also done is they've pulled in, because I've allowed this um, through the accessibility um, option, I've allowed them to pull in my personal profile information, which then showcases to me birthdays that are coming up. So now I can start to buy jeans and gifts for folks that are in my friend network that I wouldn't have thought about before. So now my experience on Levi's is relevant, it's personalized, it's customized, and it's completely sociable. A new way of thinking through social optimization and really auditing your site in order to make sure that again, not just today, but tomorrow, you are providing those social plugins and those points of interaction for your consumers to be able to scale the branding that you think is important on the social platform. The third thing that I wanted to talk about was filling, and this is probably a little bit more for the media folks in the room, but filling your target ratings gap left by TV. So this is an interesting one, right? 
publishers for the last like 10 plus years since digital has been, been around and has been measurable has been talking about how do we pull dollars from television. I, I was running an AOR for a long period of time. Uh, we did a lot of this work in terms of optimization, how we could do video neutral planning, how we could do multi-channel planning, where we could pull those TRPs and or the reach percentage points from. The problem that always existed is that there wasn't a standardized currency that lived underneath all the different platforms. So while we were talking about channel mix and we wanted that accountability and that measurement to be standardized, standardized there actually wasn't something that was available until now, Nielsen online campaign ratings. So first and foremost, if you haven't talked with Nielsen or if you're unaware of Nielsen's um, online campaign ratings um, product, definitely check it out. For a little more background though, the reason why this is significant for Facebook is a couple of different things. One of the, the um, pieces that came out in Nielsen's recent white paper is the targetability of um, other online publishers as well as television today. So what we found through this conversion to a TRP metric on the on, in the online space is that there actually is about a 73% targetability in broad targeting for other online publishers and about a 30% or 35% um, targetability rate against narrow targeting, right? So how does that translate into the television space? Well, if you were looking at American Idol against a broad category target, you get about a 55% delivery. And if you were looking at a narrow target, you'd get about a 15% delivery. If you look at Facebook, you get about a 95% plus delivery on broad, cat on broad targeting and a 90% um, delivery against narrow targeting. That has a lot to do with the fact that you are your real true self when you are logged onto Facebook. Your age and gender is optimally correct. So our ability to deliver there is um, very, very accurate. But just to pull that back out for a second, regardless of Facebook, why that's significant for you is that for the first time now, you can start to look at your channel planning mix and look at how pricing is actually playing out in the marketplace. So if you see that the scatter market is gonna be extremely high for a particular channel, and you need to be able to find a way to deliver that same type of target rating point or that same type of reach percentage for that particular month or week, you actually can still get that same type of delivery and you can go towards where the audience is and the ratings are versus having to spend just on television in order to get that. I think all that being said, there is absolutely a need for the simultaneous and integrated mix between television, print, radio, social, and digital combined. That is where we see our most effective campaigns when social is put, and Facebook in particular, is put further upstream in the planning process and is used as an integrative factor as an underpinning to that entire integrated marketing mix. But this is a very interesting way to start looking at accountability in terms of your media plans and how you're delivering against targetability today. Two more. Um, so our fourth one is considering a total market solution. When I say total market solution, what I mean by this is expanding beyond just general market and really understanding how you are speaking to the Hispanic audience. Obviously, the census reevaluated and reinforced that the Hispanic audience is larger than it has ever been before. Um, Clixie actually published back this spring that there are 22 million um, Hispanic users on the Facebook platform. That's about 70% of the Latino audience that's online, which is up from 20% the year before. So a significant audience. Now, the thing that I think is really interesting here, though, is what's your strategy and your approach? Because the Hispanic audience, depending on whether or not they're acculturated, um, whether they are non-acculturated, are they speaking Spanish, would they rather be spoken to in a bilingu bilingual um, perspective, are they just interested in English? You need to understand that segmentation in terms of how it impacts your brands and how you're using that voice on the Facebook platform. Um, Two Pantene, uh, a Procter brand, um, has done actually a really nice job 
of approaching it both from an English language perspective and a Spanish language perspective so that your consumers, uh, so their consumers as they're looking at growth opportunities for the future are feeling connected in the way that they want to connect. Is it Spanish language or is it English language? Another terrific example of an integrated campaign that was hubbed on, on Facebook was Honey Bunches of Oats. So Starcom Media Vest Group recently ran a campaign where they had radio, they had print, they had television, um, all in association with a campaign and a promotion that they were doing with a Hispanic celebrity. And the goal was to try and get people talking about the brand, talking about their experience to win a trip and um, an experience with this, with this celebrity at their concert. And they wound up not only just increasing overall likes, but what's really significant for us today is they got people talking about the brand and talking about the brand in the language of their choosing. And in this case, primarily Spanish. They were able to see not just results in terms of that storytelling piece, they were also able to see incredible results in terms of actual ROI delivery for sales volume, where they were able to become and tie the other brand that was leading in that category um, from that campaign. The last piece that I wanted to talk to you about was delivering a shareable video strategy. So more and more, clients are thinking through their content strategy approach. Are they building out 30 second spots? Are they building out custom content? Are they doing branded entertainment work with uh, various networks and publishers? all in creating incredible archives of content that can be used to trigger conversations and opportunities to share and provide interaction with consumers today. Now the question becomes, what are we doing to support this video strategy in order to make it shareable? Are you posting those um, uh, be it spots and launching those 30 second spots to your community prior to them hitting television so that they can comment and share. Um, Volkswagen did an incredible job of this actually last Super Bowl where they launched the Darth Vader spot uh, 48 hours I believe prior to the Super Bowl and it was one of the most buzzed about and talked about uh, spots of the Super Bowl prior to the Super Bowl ever even hitting. The um, other thing that you can be doing is really considering whether or not you have a video distribution strategy behind it. So who do you want to get to talk about this? How are you using our video inventory and our video ad units to actually create stories? So if people are seeing the video spot and they are op have an opportunity to comment and share, now instead of it just living on your site or living on television, there's an opportunity for stories to be created with their friends that are triggered by this content. The other piece that I think is really um, important to note is that in using our new Page Insights um, tool, which allows you to lever look at not just how your um, paid work is doing, how your earned work is doing, but also how your earned um, work is also um, working in terms of the overall dynamic of driving stories on the platform. Um, but the reason why this is really also special it's, and how it relates to video content is you can start to sort around what type of objects you are actually including in your paid earned and owned strategy. So you can see is the video content in this particular market when I launch, is it actually driving greater number of conversations? Um, are photos more effective? Uh, is the text and questions that we're asking, is that more effective in terms of engagement? What we're finding right now is that video is a very powerful medium and that you can also start to really see if you're looking at using content as a universal medium across multiple markets, you can track very easily in market how that is doing and whether or not you wanna keep that, that content live and going, or whether you need to switch that out with something that's more locally relevant for that particular market. So again, really thinking about how you socialize and share your video strategy today, today is an important piece. Um, so with that, that is the end, and just thank you so much for having me.
And that would be Sarah Personette from Facebook. Up next is Sherry Ramatian, who is the social media oh, sure. marketing manager for Intuit, and Rustin Banks, CEO of Blog Frog. Okay. Yeah, we're going to do this. And uh, I think, Rustin, you're up first, am I right? That's and you're right. both wired. This, this may or may not work. Okay. All right. Looks like we're set. So hi, everyone. I am Rustin Banks. I'm the CEO of Blog Frog, and very excited to really get into the meat of social advertising. We're going to talk numbers, we're going to talk details, and I'm even going to throw out a dollar amount at one point and, uh, and talk some ROI figures here, all right? So first off, why should you listen to me? Does anybody in this room recognize what this is on the screen? All right, a couple, a couple in, the, in the room. This is an online bulletin board. These were the very beginnings of online communities. We used to dial into these one at a time so that we could talk to each other. You'd have to wait for me to hang up before you could dial in. Well, I used to host these out of my parents' closet when I was 12 years old and salvaged 286 computers. I'd get calls from China, Russia. Today, I'd be on an FBI watch list, and tons of fun, all right? So from there, I uh, did a little stint in satellites, but then got back to my roots, and now uh, my startup, BlogFrog, we're building communities with 65,000 influential uh, women bloggers reaching 10 million every month. And then for the past year, we've been teaming those influential bloggers with brands to create communities and conversations for them with social advertising. So that's the, the parlay. And so why is this so important? Throughout this conference, you're going to hear three buzzwords, social, mobile, video, right? So you have a video social mobile solution, and you can combine it into one word. Why is that important? In five years, Social, mobile, and video are going to take down the behemoth of digital marketing search. In five years, Forrester projects that the marketers will spend more on social, mobile, and video than search engine marketing. This is huge. This has just uh, gone from percentages, a fraction in the past couple of years, to being spent more, uh, more on search. So how do you adapt to that? Well, good news in mobile and video, OK? Mobile, smaller screen, you take it with you, all right? Put some fancy technology. We know how to deliver these messages. We just need to do it on a smaller screen that can take us with us. Done, technology solution. Video, same thing. The screen's located in a different place, but we've been doing video for 60 years. Just now it's in the bedroom as opposed to in uh, the, the TV room. We can take it with us. Social is a whole other animal. It's not a technology solution. It's a mix of technology relationships, and it takes stepping back and looking at the picture from a completely different point of view. That's why social advertising is the new search engine marketing. And if you don't believe me, Google knows it too. That's why all this focus on Google Plus lately. All right? So let me talk about a couple don'ts of social advertising first. So if you take away one thing from this panel, if you... Your CEO says, hey, we need to get into social. They say, sweet, I threw up some banner ads on social sites. We're in social. Banner advertising on a social site is not social advertising. All right? At that point, you are still relying on being a distraction to the real reason why people came to that website. That is not social advertising. You have to get into the reason why people are there visiting the website. So use the buzzword, get in the conversation, if you will, that Chris talked about. But I think of it more as, are you there in the reason why the people visited the website? So a simple test, are you on the widest column on the page? Right? Is that where your marketing message is? If the answer is no, you're a banner ad. You're relying on being a distraction. If the answer is yes, you are doing social advertising. So I, what I propose is that we can actually pay to get there in the same way that we pay to buy uh, banner ads on, on the sides. Okay. So one more don't real fast before I dive into how we do that. Don't neglect the power of the interest graph. So this is my social graph. My high school friends, my friends from college, uh, my, uh, my friends from work. But to be honest, that's not what I'm truly passionate about. That's not what I spend money on. To brands, what's more valuable is what I'm interested in. So I have conversations every day 
online about technology, about entrepreneurship, with people that I don't know in real life. But we're passionate about the same thing, so we talk to each other, we engage with each other, and we spend money on what we're interested in. If you look at the number one thing that brands target when they do Facebook advertising, it's that interest field right there. That is their most valuable way to target people by interest. All right? So back into a little bit more. Um, so how do we do this? So the simplest way is to find these people who can get you into the stream. So I'm not going to talk about building your own uh, earned media. You know how to do it. That's one way is you build your own following, and then when you publish, you get into their stream through your blogs, through your Facebook, through your Twitter channels, right? The quickest and easiest way to do social advertising is to pay others who can get you in their streams for you who reach the millions of people just like you want to. All right? So turn, take your marketing message, turn it into a conversation, and then you pay people who have this reach to start this conversation on their blogs is one place, because blogs actually, people think blogs are going down. Blogs are going up. Blogs get as just as many visitors every month still as Facebook, and it continuing and going up at the same rate. People are starting to discount them. Personal blogs have gone down. Personal blogs have gone on Facebook. Interest-based blogs going up. You get a new digital SLR, what do you do? You go to Google, you type in photography tips. Where do you go? You end up on a blog, right? Okay, so not only do they get you in the message on blogs, but also on Facebook and Twitter. So the trick is people say, okay, I'll go do some sponsored content. Sponsored content is not enough. You have to engage those readers and get them to do something with this. This is where the technology comes in. You can't simply say, hey, influential person, throw up some sponsored content. It's not going to cut it in the social world. So this is our friend Jenny of Southern Savers. Uh, she's great. What's even awesome, what's great about her, she has 500,000 friends. And by friends, I mean her, her blog readers, her Facebook likes, and her Twitter followers. That's more than popular reality TV shows by this one influential blogger. That's the power we're talking about. And there, are, there are many more uh, like Jenny. And the exciting thing is, is if you can get her friends to share, you can reach 50 million friends of friends. That's 20% of the US population with engaging one blogger, right? And it comes with what we call the halo effect, or the Oprah effect. If Oprah says do it, they do it. If Jenny says do it, they do it. So Jenny is, is not going to be approached with a uh, product endorsement. She's not going to say, I love your shampoo better than anyone else, not, for, uh, not without weeks of lead time and for $100,000, right? But Jenny will say, what is my one simple beauty tip sponsored by this shampoo? She will have an elevated conversation that we call it very easily, very turnkey that your brand can participate in without requiring the whole product endorsement. So this is uh, what I'm going to talk about with some case studies, but real fast, one more bonus is this is where brands, the future uh, where brands need to go. Brands need to become publishers. Brands are the future publishers on the internet, creating valuable content all the time that readers and viewers want to consume. Brand as publisher. Right? So it is, it is our belief, and we have some uh, metrics to prove that, that every good company blog should contain a mix of, you get copywriters in a room who are creating this content, but you get people who already have this following to create the content for you, then they share it on their blogs, Facebook, and Twitter, and Google is now looking at sharing signals to realize how important a piece of content is. How much was it shared and who was it shared by? So those bloggers create that content, then they share it on their social networks. And that's really the key uh, to all these blogs that are uh, trees falling in the forest and nobody's hearing them on companies' websites. All right, it's going to do a couple uh, case studies here. So this is ABC News and the UN Foundation. We partnered with them uh, for a Million Moms Challenge. And so we said, all right, we'll take 65 of the top mom bloggers in their country We'll get metrics on them so we know that they have that combined friend that we talked about of at least four million. And then we're going to get them creating content on your site and sharing that valuable content across their networks through their blogs, Facebook, and Twitter. Well, we put the, the call out there. The 65 compensated bloggers hopped in. 
Of course, this was such a great campaign. 800 other mom bloggers jumped in to create content on their site as well, completely uncompensated as a side note. But we are able to count up all those impressions that we get in the content. And again, we're not talking about a sidebar impression. We're talking about a content impression, the reason people are actually there to visit the website. 16 million impressions across blogs, Facebook, and Twitter in two months, 15,000 signups in just the first few weeks. Here's another content example. Allstate. So created a story contest that we seeded with just 40 top bloggers who had a combined readership of, of 3 million. They quickly put out this story, share a story of your hero mom. The neat thing about that blog post right there is, again, get away from the click-through rate. Put your marketing action right where the people are. So something we focus in is you read this great content, whether it's on a blog post, a Facebook share, or Twitter, and whatever you want the reader to do at that point, we integrate it right into the blog post. So you get rid of the click-through rate. You want them to submit a story, do it right in the blog post. You want them to upload a photo, you want them to like you. We can do all that without requiring a click to some landing page and you decrease uh, your click, you get rid of that 0.1% click-through rate. People are already there and they can do your messages, they can do your marketing action right where they already are. So Allstate had over 11,000 votes in just the first two weeks. This is why I'm going to throw out a number. It didn't take months and months of planning. It didn't take a $100,000 campaign. It took three weeks, and, and, they, just, and they paid roughly $20,000 for this. So this is a great one for content, right? Horizon took it to the next level from a blog, and they actually created the, the mythical brand community. We've heard of this, right? Brand says, yeah, let's put a community on our site where people can talk to each other. And then they turn into complaint forums, right? And they say, oh, your product sucks, right? I have this, the exact opposite of what they wanted to have happen. So I said, you know what, we can fix that. We'll create you a brand community, we'll, create top, we'll recruit top bloggers to create interesting content in that community and then share that across their blogs, Facebook, and Twitter. And you know what, it works. There's thousands of interesting uh, conversations in, created in there every month Thousands of people talking, 3,000 members in just the first couple months. And they're every day. And then, which leads to, Sherry's going to talk more about Intuit. But this was a great example of they had a Love a Local Business campaign, and they were super smart. And they said, how can we turn this into a conversation that's shareable? That's another key word, creating shareable content. So take the marketing objective, Love a Local Business. Said, so you know what's really interesting content? What, local, what business would you like to start? We all have that dream of being the coffee shop owner and, and uh, running, our own, uh, running our own business. So they put that out to the bloggers. They said, this is what I would really love to do if I could. Sponsored by Intuit, nominate your local business, love your local business, and Sherry's going to talk about that. But thank you very much. I'll be around if you have any questions. I'm Rustin Banks, the CEO of BlogFrog, and there's my contact information. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. So as Rustin said, I'm Sherry Ramachian. I work on Intuit's social media team. So how many people in this room are not familiar with Intuit as a brand? A couple of you, okay. Let me give you a little bit of context. Um, Intuit is the company behind some really big brands like TurboTax, Quicken, QuickBooks, um, Mint.com. So we make financial tax and accounting software for consumers and small businesses. We've been around for over 25 years and are the biggest provider of solutions for small businesses. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about, first, I'll take a little bit of a step back and talk about just what social media is to Intuit. So what is social and how do we kind of divide it up into different areas of focus? Uh, and then I'll talk about the Love Local Business campaign that Rustin mentioned and um, how we kind of brought the paid social um, and complemented that with what we were already doing and earned um, with the campaign. So, start a little bit with um, Intuit's social media framework. So, forgive me, I'm gonna use a couple buzzwords on this slide, um, but I'll explain kind of what, what those buzzwords mean. So, uh, we think about social media and our strategy in kind of four different um, key areas. The first, and arguably the most important, is content. So, it's really what do you want people to talk about? What are you giving them to say, to react to? to share, um, is it interesting, is it compelling, is it what people want to talk about? Um, so we do that um, through a number of things. One is the campaign I'll discuss, but also on a daily basis, we have a small business blog, 
Um, we have a lot of video content we're starting to produce, um, infographics, whatever it is that people um, are, are reacting to and usually related to small business in my case. Um, second is community engagement. So engagement's that word we all love to use. Um, that's finding people who are our advocates or, or who are also influencers in their own space. For us, a lot of times that's accountants, um, but really we have over 4 million small businesses using a product like QuickBooks every day to run their business. Um, and they want to share about that. They want to be our advocates because it's what keeps their business going. Um, and so how do we build um, programs and um, build, um, you know, build that network up and, and engage with those people? Um, third, and this is kind of my focus on our team, is social networks and acquisition. So, so many social networks out there. How do we think about a presence on Facebook differently from a presence on Twitter or LinkedIn or now, as of a couple of days ago, um, Google Plus? So, what, um, you know, what is our purpose on those networks? Not just for the sake of having one, but what do we want the experience to be like for our customers who come there or our potential customers who come there? And um, how do we bring fans there? And what do we do with them once they like us or once they follow us? And, follow, and um, finally, um, and probably the most untapped, at least for us, is um, in product. So you know, we have a range of products, millions of people using our products every day um, and hopefully liking our product um, as they're using it. So what are the opportunities that we have to build social directly into our products? So, um, an example that we um, currently have of this is when you use TurboTax, um, which I do, probably many of you do as well, um, the best feeling is when you are done with the taxes and it's, it's over. And um, hopefully, you know, that's, that's a great feeling and that's um, been enabled by TurboTax. So giving you the opportunity to share with your network um, right at that moment in the product. So that's kind of the, the background for all this. There's a lot of stuff that we do um, that you know, everybody should be doing in each of these areas of focus. Um, the thing that we realized a couple years ago is you know, um, from a brand perspective, we want Intuit to continue to represent small business success. So we are advocates for small business, and we see the future of our economic growth coming from local and small businesses. And so we never um, had a campaign really that focused on that message and getting um, people to talk about into it in that light. So that was kind of the um, birthplace of Love Local Business. So this is a campaign that's, um, that's still going on. Um, it's over two years old now. Um, but it's essentially a small business grants competition where um, we give away over $50,000 a month to um, deserving local businesses around the country. And it's really just as simple as I, um, as a consumer or a small business owner, love a local business in my neighborhood. So for me, it's my favorite sandwich place in San Francisco where I live, um, and I'm going to go and um, nominate that business for a grant. Um, and so, of course, when I, when I talk about content being compelling and being, you know, the, the um, place where you start, this is um, already a really compelling subject. People want to talk about um, buying local, why, why supporting local businesses is important, especially these days. Um, and so it's already something people wanted to engage in, really um, compelling content. Um, we also made it... Uh, oh, so this is an example of a business who won Small Bed and Breakfast, um, who we highlighted on our blog a couple months ago. Um, we also just made it really easy for people to share. So it's, it's shareable content to begin with. We made it really easy for them to, as soon as you submit a nomination, um, share it on a social network, um, and to create video about um, why you love local businesses, why it's important to you to support small business. Um, and we actually find that over 30% of nominations on our site are shared on a social network, which is pretty impressive. Um, so, so initially, so this campaign is now over two years old. Initially, we seeded it really just with PR effort and, um, you know, earned uh, social or advertising on our, on our corporate Facebook pages, um, which can take you pretty far. Which, so we saw a really, really good response and a lot of engagement on um, Love Local Business. Actually, I think 60% of traffic coming to our site around there comes from a Facebook page. So people learning about it that way. But we really wanted to now blow this out, make it bigger, and um, find a new audience, um, expand the reach of the competition to um, um, to a new audience, but also in a new way. So that's where Rustin came into the picture, um, and we 
did a almost two month long blog frog sponsored conversation. So um, Rustin mentioned a little bit about this before, but essentially uh, that elevated conversation of um, what's your dream business? What, what business would you love to start? So again, something that people want to talk about. I could probably ask anybody in this room and they would have an answer for, for that question. Um, so this is kind of, uh, you can see the conversation that's happening um, on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, still a call to action to nominate your favorite lo uh, local business um, and, and branded by Intuit. But it's really more than just hey, here's Intuit, here's what we do and what we stand for, and more than just nominating a business, it's creating a conversation that lasts longer, that um, makes you think more, that, that really ups the level of engagement that you have um, from a traditional ad. So there uh, were a couple different components to um, the, the campaign, one being, um, of course, the bloggers, over 70 bloggers um, writing uh, about a, a post dedicated to our campaign and to, um, you know, of course, into it. Um, we had a Twitter party, um, so thousands of tweets really um, concentrated in an hour conversation about local business, um, about which businesses you frequent, why you would want to start a business, what business that would be, um, and and of course a lot of um, sharing just. Um, on social networks. So you see that number 14, over 14 million impressions, obviously really successful. That's a, that's a great number. We love to see that. Um, we often measure in social, you know, one of our measurements, of course, is impressions. I think this um, number, though, is a lot more than just impressions. It's not just how many people are seeing our name or our logo or even um, the branding of the competition, but it's really people coming to spend time talking about um, talking about the message we want them to deliver on our behalf. So it's not just um, you know, into it as a brand, but it's, it's supporting local business and, and in the context of our campaign and of our brand. So really um, a powerful way to reach a new audience and really take a campaign that we know has legs to begin with. We saw really successful just with minimal unpaid um, advertising to really take it to the next level with something paid. So, um, you know, we think about it not as an and or or, but really um, they really go together. Um, and so that's, I think, what's made this campaign really successful. Um, and finally, I have a really quick plug because we're hiring. <laughs> um, and so I sit on our brand advertising team and I've never heard of anyone complain when they hear about job opportunities at conference, so I thought I would uh, throw this up there, but our advertising team is hiring. So check us out if you're interested in participating in um, campaigns like this. And I think that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry, and thank you, Rustin. And as we all know, it is time to dine. Thank you very, very much. And we saw there was a, a kind of an interesting dispersed bunch of thoughts, but when we come back in the afternoon, uh, what, what's at 2.15? Math is hard. We have more to the story. So don't go to the other panels. They're not nearly as good. There may or may not be a resurgence of nudity and cream cheese. Thank you so much. I'm Chris Brogan.